Hi there! Welcome back to another video on my channel. Today I'm talking to you guys about what I read this month in the month of April. Um, to be honest, it wasn't like a super ton <laughs> so because this month has been quite a month. Um, I keep praying that these months get easier and I feel like I'm getting sucker punched every time. So um, yeah, so I don't have a whole lot of content for you this month, um, but I'll just tell you about the books I read anyway. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, just keep on watching. Okay, so the first book I finished is, I don't have it with me right now because I rented it from the library because libraries are important, um, but I rented it from the library and I've already returned it, um, but I think it's called The Unidentified and it's got like a long subtitle, but it's basically talking about like uh, myths and cryptids and stuff and like the unexplained and like why people want to believe in the unexplained. Um, this is a, <laughs> I loved it. I, I think I rated this five stars. Um, but it is a nonfiction book that uh, talks about um, this this man's quest to basically figure out like wh why why do these like fringe groups of people who believe in ghosts and cryptids um, like Bigfoot Mothman uh, why do they exist and why do they think the way they do? Um, this book is really cool because it goes into the history of like certain pseudosciences and. Oh, excuse me. It's the history of certain pseudosciences it talks about where they come from and like the sociological reasonings why they originated. And it goes all the way back to like um, the spiritualist movement or even like um, the, what is it, the Great Expansion or a Manifest Destiny or whatever. Like it goes far, far, far back um, to talk about like, like the very beginning is talking about like manifest destiny all these people are moving out uh west and there's this one guy in particular and i don't remember his name i'm so so sorry but he was part of that group that wanted to move um out west to try to make some coin uh he came from a family with money and tried to make it on his own and failed and, and then became a writer and um there was already this interest in atlantis specifically like coming up around that time so he basically wrote his own fan fiction about atlantis and like published it and um he basically that became the foundation for a lot of like conspiracy theorist thinking today um specifically about like um how do i put this um there's like a certain words for these people and i remember i engaged i literally ate through this book and went sitting so i'm trying to remember all the vocabulary because this was earlier in the month um but uh, yeah there are some people who believe in a very um and advanced aliens that have very much like eurocentric features that are meant to be like a better version of us with wisdom and that they are atlanteans but um they think that atlantis isn't necessarily anywhere near greece they think that um atlantis is like in the middle of the ocean pacific ocean basically some people think it's in um a mountain um on the west coast of um, the United States. It's like a really hippy dippy trippy <laughs> place, or it's been co-opted, sorry, by hippy dippy type people. But yeah, even people to this day think that these sorts of alien beings live inside this mountain and um, that they can communicate telepathically with them or something. I don't know. Anyway, the reason why that book got so popular and why he continued to write some books after the fact is because it was based in some scientific truth. Like, um, so when he was talking about Atlantis, he was talking about a hidden continent underneath the ocean. And um, at that time, people were thinking about, like, um, they were thinking about, like, pre-Pangea, right? And uh, I think they're called Lumerians. Okay, maybe they're called Lumerians. I don't know. Anyway, there's <laughs> my brain. Uh, they were talking about, like, a pre-Pangea idea where um, there were continents that are underneath the ocean floor because the continents sunk over time instead of... Um, before the idea of a supercontinent like Pangea came about where it like broke off and then like stuff floated away um people thought that there were ancient uh continents called uh, this one specifically named Lumeria because the guy who came up with this theory was thinking about uh lemurs from like Madagascar and like Africa and stuff and they were wondering how um basically they got there right and uh thinking about like genetic diversity and like how lemurs got to madagascar and they said oh well there must be like a connecting land body or a sunken continent that would explain where all these lemurs came from 
So that's why the name of the continent, the real one that they were hypothesizing was called Lumeria. And they thought, the scientists thought, like it just sunk to the ocean floor. Um, now we know that the running theory is that Pangaea was a mega continent and then it broke off into smaller continents and there you go. So what that guy did as an author and as a completely creative work uh, was that he took that idea of Lumeria and then said this is actually what Atlantis is and then came up with this race of beings that is like far superior to us and blah blah blah. So people took that and then ran with it. <laughs> And it became its own, like, pseudo-religion based off of something people consider to be science um, instead of just being science fiction. So that guy totally leaned into it, though. <laughs> and um, so much so where he, I don't know if he called himself a doctor or what kind of credentials he, um, he, uh, not extrapolated, yeah, extrapolated on um, to make himself seem more scientific because at that time there was this, like, um, hidden fear even with the manifest destiny that there's nowhere else on earth to explore so people because people were going out west and they were conquering the new world you know um they thought okay there's still a place left for us to explore regardless if people were already on the north american continent or not right like <laughs> um people were already there but the white people were like there's no place place for us to conquer uh so let's start making up places and um, the same sort of social anxiety about there's no place left that's unknown rings true in a lot of like these conspiracy theory type stories. It's like about a land that's yet to be discovered, a species that's yet to be discovered. Um, and so basically the author talks about that initially, talks about the history of certain uh, movements and how they're kind of based in science, but not really. It's like... Um, these people feel like science, the sciences in general are really like gatekeepy, even though like, yeah, there's educational barriers, barriers to understanding science and the pursuit of science um, that isn't necessarily made available to the general public. That's like an issue that's still today. But even like way back in the day, like scientist people were just kind of like, they had the same adventurous spirit, really, where they just kind of like fucked around and found out. Um <laughs> You know, they put on these public demonstrations for folks about science, um, but that kind of culture changed and then science got a lot more elusive for folks. And so with that, coupled with the fact that the world was shrinking for people, um, there was just this frustration with people who didn't necessarily have those credentials, who still felt like an adventurous spirit or a need to conquer. And so those sorts of social psychological elements are kind of present and the author goes through different periods of history and like the first sightings of certain monsters like the Yeti, um, talks about Mothman, um, talks about Bigfoot, and talks about aliens and um, all sorts of things. And then it gets into specific aspects of like what sort of fears or whatever come about with aliens. Um, how do the aliens represent our fears of race? Because one of the first uh, UFO contact things um, actually affected an interracial couple um, during a time where it was very dangerous to be in an interracial couple. And um, that's where the first mentioning of the greys comes from because the wife, um, the guy, like when he was describing the aliens that he perceived, he had no problem assigning already previously known races to these guys. He's like, oh, they're kind of Irish. They're kind of the, right? But the wife didn't want to like make it seem like, because if she said that if they were white, it feeds into these stereotypes of like white people are superior beings. But also if she said that they worked, looked black, um, they would feed into these like negative stereotypes about black people being dangerous. So she said that they were gray, um, which is other and unknown, which I thought that was an interesting like take. Um, I don't know if she consciously did that or not, but that's something that the author puts forward in the book, which I thought was very interesting. Um, but I'm like jumping around from chapters. So I'm not really talking uh, cohesively and I apologize for that. But I'm just trying to remember, like, all the context and information is flooding back to me. Um, but basically, at the end of it, you it's just talking about how um, there is, even today, like, a disconnect between those who want to be adventurous and engage in these sorts of things and, like, their capacity to do so. So they kind of cling on to these, like, Bigfoot alien type conspiracy theories to kind of, like, feel something again, I guess. Um, but of course, like, oh, this book got some mixed reviews when I was looking at it online, because a lot of people took offense um, to some of the things that were said, because um, it's not that this author was completely dismissive of these sorts of anomalies, right? 
but they were very skeptical and critical, right? Which I feel like you should do if you're writing a nonfiction book. Like you should always be skeptical and critical or, or, or present counter arguments to what's being said. Um, but some people disliked, disliked that who are very involved in these things. And um, I initially got this because that kind of, again, I, I talked about this in a different video about my interests. I am so interested in people and psychology and why people do the way, the things they do. And I must admit, you know, I put on ancient aliens to help me fall asleep, you know, uh, but even with that show, right? Like he mentioned, um, Mr. What's his name? Gregorio, uh, something, the guy with the hair, <laughs> um, and how like this, this guy's made a living off of the show. Right. But he proudly boasts that he doesn't actually have a degree in paleontology or, or archaeology or anything like that. But he dresses like Indiana Jones and like cosplays that. Um, but people eat it up anyway, right? Because he's more relatable. He's more like the viewer who is like this anti-establishment, like adventurer guy. I don't know. <laughs> so, so um, yes. Anyway, I don't know. I, I found this book to be very insightful. I'm somebody who watches that stuff for fun. Um, I'm not really, sh I have my own beliefs about spirituality and things like that, or like, like aliens and stuff, but I'm not in the realm of like, because you can easily, when you get in this, can go towards like an alt-right conspiracy theory spiral. Um, I don't think that's healthy at all. Do I think that there's other life in the universe? Of course I do. I think just based on odds it is very likely that there's some form of existence outside of us um whether i believe that like we are being guided by aliens to do a certain thing i, I don't know if anything i feel like the aliens wouldn't want to come here because girl this planet is a mess let's be real and like regarding other cryptids or other animals um they talk about the Loch Ness monster too but like i don't really take them seriously i kind of like them as just folk stories um, and like looking at them through a lens of more of like anthropology to see like, okay, like, you know, every area, local area has its monsters, right? Like depending on the landscape or depending on the kind of culture at the time, they're going to come up with some sort of monster to explain like why things go wrong or, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, so I kind of enjoy those stories in that sense. Like, do I really think Mothman is real, real? No, <laughs> but like, I love Mothman. I got Mothman plushies. I got a Mothman mug. I love Mothman as like a harbinger or like a harbinger of like disasters and chaos accidentally. I like picturing him in my head as this guy that's just really trying to help out. But every time he does, shit gets fucked up. And I think that kind of story is relatable. So for me, it's like, Am I going to be disappointed if some guy is really critiquing the fact that he doesn't think Mothman exists? No, that's not me. But there are some diehard people out there. And he kind of pokes fun at the diehard people a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Um, but again, this book was very insightful, very fun. Um, he actually travels to different places and interviews different folks um, about their experiences with their local cryptid or whatever in the United States. Um, the one place he went to that I really want to go is the Little Alien Inn. Um, I, fun fact, in grad school, um, I tried to, tried and didn't succeed to get a grant to go uh, to Area 51 because at that time, the meme uh, Storm Area 51 was a thing. And um, I wanted to see if like people could actually mobilize for a cause with a meme, what even as ridiculous as that one. And I wanted to show up and basically see like what kind of, how many people went there and um, my professor said it was a good proposal or, or the professor that was going to approve it said it was good, but they were just concerned about my safety going to a highly protected government facility. And I was like, dang, okay. <laughs> so I didn't get to go, but the author of this book went and um, yeah, I thought that was fascinating. So who knows? Maybe I'll go to area 51 some other time by myself, but um, I just wanted to be part of the movement at the time. But anyway, I really like this book. I gave it five stars. Um, this is nonfiction, but it's fun nonfiction, and um, I got it to really help with a project of mine, but it ended up being like a lot more fun than I thought. So, yeah. This is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. This is a fiction book, and it is like romance fantasy, I guess. Um, I don't read a lot of romance, but I do like this one. Um, before you ask, there's no spice, no spice in this, which is fine with me. <laughs> Um, I am not somebody who reads a lot of spicy romance, and I'll talk about that later in the video. Um, so I don't mind, like, a slow build. This is a very, very, very slow burn. So if you're not into that, you won't like that. It was a fun with me. Um, this is about a woman who is an academic, 
she feels very academic. People who are in ac- academia, like, they they kind of act like this. <laughs> um, so this woman is an academic who studies fairies and all the different types of fae in this world. Um, she is trying to write a book, an encyclopedia, and um, she it travels to a different country to basically study the fae there in this, like, very wintry landscape, in this icy wins- landscape. Um, she she goes there with a dog so it's very important to mention that there is a dog in this book for people who like dogs um she goes there with her dog he's kind of like her protector throughout the whole time but then later on her like work rival i guess somebody else who's another academic kind of tags along for the ride his name's wendell and uh he is her opposite so he she is not very like good with social skills at all and she doesn't give a damn about anybody else uh, she is solely motivated by her academic pursuits and will put herself in harm's way uh, just to get answers for her academic pursuits, right? Um, put others in harm's way as well, potentially. So her um, academic rival or her uh, co-worker, his name is Wendell. He is very handsome, very charming. Um, he is a Mr. Cool Guy, I guess, and has spoken on a lot of panels. He's got a lot of influence. In academia, she suspects him of faking some of his research, which is also spicy. Um, <laughs> well, his research isn't spicy as in, you know, romance spicy, but spicy as in drama. Um, so, yeah, he fakes some of his things. He's, like, a really spoiled guy. If Okay, I'm going to make a, a weird claim. Um, there's something called the sassy man apocalypse going on. And at first it started out as, like, a homophobic thing, but then it turned into men embracing their sassier sides, which I fully support. Um, especially straight men, straight cis men, because we gotta let just just let them get out of the fucking patriarchy and like expectations for themselves. Let them be sassy. Let them have fun. So anyway, this is very much a sassy man. And so if you don't already tell, it's like uh, not enemies to lovers, but like rivals to lovers, basically. And so he shows up there and he's willing to help her out with this book and even write the foreword or something. Um, but he's there doing research with her. Okay, cool. So, um, he is very much a sassy man, but all the bitches love him. And, uh, she suspects him of being a fairy. So, yeah, that's what makes things cool, is that, um, she's learning more about the fairies in there, and, like, a bunch of stuff happens. I'm not gonna spoil anything for you, but she also suspects this Wendell guy of being a fairy. Um, even, he, like, likes her, he likes bugging her, she doesn't really like him a lot at first. Um, but I read this, and it reminded me so much of my goddamn husband. (laughs) Like, sassy man apocalypse. So, basically, I hate to be, bring astrology into it, but let me tell you. My husband is a Gemini rising, okay? He has a Libra sun. He actually has a Libra stellium. So, he, his Mars, his sun, and his Mercury are all in Libra, okay? Then, this man also has a Capricorn stellium with all his outer planets, okay? So, that's what you need to know about my husband. You know everything, basically. Um... And, uh, he reminds me, if, if, if Douglas was a mythical creature, he would probably be a sassy fairy man, because the fae, like, kind of do tricks on everybody, sure, but they operate just in a mode of chaos. It's neither good nor evil, necessarily, it's just whatever they feel like, and, um, they are just here to m- play with people, I guess. They see people as playthings, and that is apparent throughout the book. Emily knows this very well. And even though she can't abide by human social rules, she knows a lot about fairy social rules. And that actually helps her out of a lot of situations, even though she's socially awkward with peoples. Um, so yeah, when I was reading this, the main guy and all of his sassy, handsome glory remind me a lot of my husband because my husband is a very sassy man. He's a very proud and vain man. Um, so I kind of liked the love interest because of, of that. And I'm really interested. This is like the first in a series. Um, and the second book came out recently and I think the third is being worked on. So, um, I plan on getting the second book of this. I actually really like this. I'm not a huge fan of romance, but they had so much like world building in here that it didn't feel like a strict romance. It was like adventure and stuff too. Um, what was I going to say? I did see like a, a, an old friend of mine on Goodreads reviewed this and she was critical of the world building, said that there was, she said there was stuff in here that wouldn't occur at that time frame. So she was pretty nitpicking of the world building. 
Um, I this for me felt like more of like a cozy fun read, so I wasn't really nitpicking anything about like historical accuracies. But if that's important to you, um, it might be important to note. This would be a cozy read despite all the flowers on the front. Most of this book takes place in a winter like setting, so this might be a cozy Christmas read if you want. Um, but it, I wouldn't say it's like low stakes adventure, but it felt like a cozy fantasy to me. Maybe not nearly as much as like Legends and Lattes. I've talked about that book before on this channel. Um, but this is slightly more adventurous than the mm, it's a little bit more adventurous than Legends and Lattes, but it's not like full on fighting gore or anything like that. So um, if you do, it sounds interesting to you, please pick it up. I really enjoyed this book. I actually got this recommendation from uh, with Cindy as well. Cause can you tell I really like her channel? I reference her a lot. Um, but anyway, so with Cindy recommended this book, I picked it up. I like it. I'm going to be picking up the sequel in this and hopefully the third book as well. So yeah, here we go. Okay, so the last book, well, novella I read in April, um, I actually got in a giveaway um, from an author mutual on threads slash Instagram. So I read a, a novella called One Click Away and it is by Madison Diaz. I got this for free, so thank you, Madison. Um, and I put my reveal up on Goodreads already, I think, um, but I'll just talk about it here too. So this is a very spicy romance. This is really out of my comfort zone, let me tell you. Um, I don't normally read stuff like this, so I was caught off guard. But I, I mean, I enjoyed it, but it's like, yeah. <laughs> so um, if you are somebody who reads a lot of erotica or like spicy ro romance books uh you might like this one it is like a fake dating at first um story and uh office romance type vibes so basically the main character like she's tired of her mom getting in her business and her mom's trying to set her up with her ex-boyfriend she doesn't want to be with her ex-boyfriend so she puts out an ad to try to see if somebody will pretend to be her boyfriend around family events, which I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, I guess that could be relatable. And um, the male love interest is her boss. And he is looking for a fake girlfriend because he wants to be CEO of the um, magazine company, I think. And his grandfather won't give it to him because the grandfather wants to know that he can be a family man. And he's in competition with his cousin who is a family man already, but the cousin doesn't really want the job. Um, so he wants a fake girlfriend to see, meet his family. So he answers the, the main character's ad and um, they realize, oh no, it's like my boss. <laughs> and they decide to go with, along with it anyway. And then it turns out they actually start liking each other and then they get a relationship forming from there. Um, there is a lot of sex <laughs> right away I'm so, I'm so i'm so awkward for talking because i'm just not the intended audience and i really appreciate the copy and you know i'm going to promote my friends um but yeah I, i'm not the intended audience for this i don't think because i'm like sometimes when i see a sex scene on tv i'm like oh, you know like that's just like who i am um but again if you like office romances if you like this book also takes place around Christmas time, I think. So it's like a Christmassy type book. I know the romance girlies like love their tropes. So I'm just listing off the tropes. So like, yeah, office romance. He is her boss. Um, apparently that's cool. And their company. Um, he's her boss. She's a writer. Um, and what else? Uh, yeah, fake dating at first. And then it turns into like them having a real relationship. Um, she also talks about like, family stuff so it's a really short read it's more of a novella but i powered through really quickly yeah, yeah, yeah i still enjoyed it so um yeah so if you want to check out madison's book here it is you can probably find it on amazon i think it's on amazon in uh, ebook format as well okay that's everything i read for april uh thank you so much for listening to me ramble on about books that i like <laughs> and i'm hoping that may's reads are going to be just as fun as april's oh before I go, I should talk about this one because I don't know if I'm going to finish it or not. So I got this from the library. It, the, the sheen. Um, it is called ID, How Hereditary, Her Heredity and Experience Make You Who You Are by Winifred Gallagher. Um, I started this because I'm trying to learn more about like personality forming 
and like why we are the way we are like what's the biological evolutionary biological use for personalities um and i am learning with this book but the thing is it was published in 1996 and it's a little outdated and like some of the stuff they say i'm not sure if i agree with um but i have learned a lot reading this book so hopefully i'm supposed to finish it by like may 4th because it's due this weekend um so hopefully i can read through that if not i might like decide not to finish it but i should include that in this month technically instead because i'm supposed to be reading it this month have i actually done it not really <laughs> but anyway so that book is also on my list sorry um but yeah so hopefully may's reads are a lot more fun um i got those new books from the uh, women and children's first bookstore i'm going to probably try to read through those um and yeah let's see if may is a little bit easier than April because April has been quite a whirlwind for the Van Gundy Pupio Pereira household. Uh, yeah. Um, but thank you for listening to me anyway. And um, if you like this kind of content, feel free to like, comment down below, share with a friend, and subscribe to the channel. Please, please, please. Um, all that engagement would really help me out a lot. And until next time, thanks. Bye.